Hi, everybody. How's it going? We're going to be talking about Kubernetes runtime security. I guess it's been up there the whole time, so you, you would know if you're already in the wrong room. I already know. But yeah, so um, runtime security is about security of the, like, when your actual stuff is running. So, um, which we'll get into in a lot more detail, obviously. But before we get into that, let me tell, oh, actually, and I'm using, you see a lot of cloud logos on my slide deck, but I just thought it was a less visually offensive slide deck that I put together on my own. Uh, it's actually mostly a Kubernetes talk, so there won't be much Google Cloud specific stuff in this presentation, but I will be using some of that for, for convenience. I'll be using GKE for a lot of my Kubernetes stuff, just because it's easy. But before I get into actual technical content, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm a security advocate at Google on cloud platform. Um, and in this role, I get to spend a lot of time researching topics related to security in the cloud. Then I get to come to conferences and talk to people like you um, about security stuff so that you can stay safer when you use cloud computing. At least that's my hope. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and actually, I've just started to pivot towards security topics. My background is really web and mobile application development for like the last 10-ish years. And recently started to pivot into security after I briefly started peeking into IoT stuff and was slightly horrified by a lot of the stuff I discovered and decided there was, there was more work to be done in security stuff. I caught the security bug and I've been kind of heading that way ever since. And this is actually one of my first talks about security stuff. So, as always, I love to hear from people. Um, so if, I have any, if you have any feedback, things that were awesome, this was useful, things, things I got wrong, things I could do better, things that were awesome, definitely reach out to me and let me know. I love hearing from people. Twitter is a great way to contact me. I'm Miming Codes on Twitter. Just drop me a DM. And if you'd like to contact me via a different means or find slides I've presented in the past or something, you can go to my homepage and it links off to all that stuff. So enough about me. Let me learn a little bit about all of you. Because as I said, this is one of my first security talks, so I'm still kind of calibrating my content to the audience. So now I get to grill all of you. So how many of you are using Kubernetes in production right now? A few people, okay. How many of you are using containers for anything? Ooh, a lot of people, okay, great. So a lot of this stuff is actually relevant to containers in general, um, even if you're using other ways to orchestrate them or just orchestrating them manually. And how about the flip side of that? How many of you identify as like security engineers or like pen testers or anything like that? A couple people, okay. So I apologize ahead of time for some oversimplifications and things I will gloss over. Uh, we can talk about it after my talk. Um, how many of you have uh, done, tinkered around the security stuff and gotten a shell on a system before, like via like a CTF or a pen test? Oh, great, okay, a few more people. Uh, and the, one of my favorite questions for, for audiences like this, how many of you have discovered a system at some point that it turns out had been compromised for a really long time? Only a few people, so that means there's probably some of you who have something compromised somewhere that you haven't found yet. Um, this actually happened to me recently. Um, at my apartment complex, we have a security camera that broke when the power went out. It turns out the, the CMOS battery, the battery for the clock, was dead. And when I went to swap it out, I realized that it, had, it was infested with malware, and it was probably part of a botnet called Mirai that was big trouble. Um, we had never really thought to secure it at all, apparently, because we never thought anyone would care to look at our security cameras. Uh, turns out you don't actually have to be the target to get caught up in those kinds of things. Uh, it's always an interesting discovery and a good lesson in good security hygiene. So here's what we're gonna be talking about in more detail, agenda, if you will. So we're gonna do a little bit of security overview, just kind of what security, the security mindset to kind of help set the stage for the rest of the conversation. Then I'm gonna go a little bit faster through containers and Kubernetes overview, just to also kind of get our terminology down for the rest of the conversation. Then I'm going to talk about how security has changed as a result of the, the rise of containers and how our perspective has had to shift a little bit from more traditional security stuff. I'll follow that up with a demo of uh, my, an insecure app getting pwned, of course. It'll be, it'll be a simple app. 
And then I'm going to use that as a way to introduce you to some kind of very low-hanging fruit you can do in Kubernetes. You know, when you only have like an hour or two, because we never have time to implement security stuff, that you can do to your Kubernetes deployment um, or your, con you know, your containerized application to kind of patch things up so you, you, know, you don't have to spend a ton, ton of time. And then I'll discuss a little bit some higher up fruit that if you have more time and somehow you've made the business case to actually do more security stuff, you can investigate in more depth. How does that sound? Sounds like a plan? Yay! Okay, let's dig in. So first, let's talk about security stuff. This will be one of the more hand-wavy parts of my talk. It'll get more concrete as we go on. So let's talk about security from kind of the offense versus defense perspective. So if you're doing offensive security, like obviously as a legitimate penetration tester or red team to, to help someone improve security, never as a bad person, um, you'd have a goal in mind. You're usually going to figure out a goal often from the outside, maybe from, from later on in the process. So you're going to have some kind of goal, and these goals usually align on one of three different axes, which is why it's this, this, this particular diagram is almost always rep represented as a triangle. Um, it's either going to be some kind of goal that's about uh, corrupting integrity of data, like corrupting data on somebody's system to cause them to have a bad day because their valuable data is gone. Or it's going to be something that's about interrupting availability, like my security camera was compromised to try to interrupt people's availability through a denial of service attack. It was a denial of service zombie. Or it's something that's trying to, to violate your company or your organization's confidentiality, get access to data that they shouldn't have access to, and then do bad things with it and ruin, ruin your day. So there's many different kinds of goals people are going to have. And the goals don't always live, and they never live in isolation. There's never just a goal sitting out there that's either perfectly protected or not protected at all. It always has other stuff around it. So an offensive security person will spend a lot of their time investigating the environment, both defensive measures that are in place, like firewalls, maybe cryptography used to, to conceal information, and also intermediate resources that they can use as kind of jumping off points to go cause trouble. And as they investigate a, a target, a goal, they're going to find more and more of these different potential systems. They'll kind of fuzz around and explore the ecosystem, maybe explore the network, maybe do some like scanning, you know, DNS enumeration. Like they can do, you can do a lot of intelligence from the outside even before you, you step in. And at some point, they'll figure out kind of a happy path along a bunch of these intermediate systems that bypasses a bunch of the defensive measures that have been put in place. And that forms a kill chain, which is a terminology borrowed from military. Um, but generally what it is, is kind of like finding that happy path through all the systems. And this process is, it's a lot like software development in ways I've, I've found. It's kind of like building for a piece of software that has a terrible, just an awful API. Because we've all been in a situation before, we picked up a client library that was just unusable for some reason, like it was not documented at all, um, I apologize now if it was a Google API. That happens sometimes. Um, but anyway, like we, sometimes we need to use it. So we'll try and riddle information out of that. We'll try and read the tea leaves, figure out the oracles. We'll maybe disassemble the library. Maybe we'll run it in a REPL and see what behavior it actually has. We'll kind of fuzz it to kind of figure out how it behaves in certain ways, um, some of which are probably documented real API features, and some of which are just unintended behaviors. And that's kind of what you do on offensive security. You're trying to find all of those details indirectly, and you're trying to kind of gain an information advantage over the people who are doing defensive security. So in defensive security, is kind of the opposite situation, where you have many things that you want to protect, many things that are kind of potential goals that somebody might want to come and compromise. And you also know you have a whole bunch of intermediate systems, which, you know, in an ideal world, you could just lock them all down entirely. But if nobody can get to your web application, it's not very useful. So everything is a compromise. And you want to spend time making sure that you have a, a broad exposure of barriers that you set up to prevent people from doing offensive activities against you. Not necessarily very deep barriers all the time, because as an offensive person, if I encounter a situation where I see something very hard, I'm just going to try and find a way around it. It's kind of like building a fence post in the desert. Um, somebody who's an adversary is not going to come and climb that fence post. They're just going to step around it. 
but you spend your time trying to find those holes that someone might take advantage of and, and plug them up. And also, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to keep an eye on all of the different resources and intermediate things that you're trying to protect so that if somebody does try to execute a kill chain, an execute attack, or just come around and start, come in and start looking around, you can identify that early so you can reduce the damage before it occurs. And then after that, which inevitably does happen, after you have some kind of incident that you found and hopefully nothing too serious, you want to be able to gather as much information from the results there to do forensic analysis so that you can go back later and add more blocks in the appropriate place. So you want to take that information advantage that the offensive person has raised against you and you want to raise it up to the next level and learn from what they did and your own mistakes so that next time they come, you know more about your systems than they do. Okay, so that's security in a nutshell. Super high level, super hand wavy. Um, but hopefully it'll kind of set some context for as we explore the rest of this stuff. Let's talk about containers and Kubernetes, or as much as I can cover in like about five minutes. Let's find out. So the way I like, I like to think of containerization and Kubernetes and container orchestration in general is it's kind of like the promise virtualization had a long time ago, except it actually works. Because um, I remember when virtualization was first really starting to get traction, and I was an early adopter, and I had this dream of like declarative infrastructure, but it was always too wieldy, unwieldy, having these giant images move around, um, all different, like, and just the tooling was not good enough to actually make that a declarative thing and build things from scratch every time. So it didn't really end up being declarative. It ended up just basically more machines, where I had a bunch of you know guest operating systems that I'd end up using my own configuration management on directly. Um, but containerization, which is an old concept that's been around, although the tooling has certainly become amazingly good recently, takes a slightly different perspective. It uses an enormous amount of the host operating system across all the different containers in there. So that the containers generally contain your application and the libraries and dependencies and not much else, which means that in general they can be very, very small and very, very easy to recreate. And this gives us, along with all the tooling that's developed, this gives us the capability to do declarative infrastructure, to tear down machines and bring them back up you know, at a moment's notice, to do auto-scaling very rapidly, and it's been awesome. And as a result, we have a lot of containers running in places where we might, you know, where previously we had a very small number of, of you know, virtualized nodes or stuff running on metal. And this brings up its own new set of challenges where a lot of the tools we used to work in terms of configuration management just become insufficient. Like those tools all still work, but they're not enough anymore. We end up with too many things to manage at once. And that's where orchestration tooling like Kubernetes comes in. Kubernetes is another layer of abstraction on top of that that gives us some larger chunks of stuff to work with. So for example, the physical computing substrate the machines we're actually running on are called nodes. And we use those nodes to, to host all of our containers. But we don't just think about individual containers. Sometimes we want containers to exist, coexist in a kind of a tight coupling. So in Kubernetes, we take that those tightly coupled containers and we group them together in pods. So for example, if you have a web server and you have a local cache that it uses, those have generally got to be on the same physical host for a lot of reasons, including performance and a lot of reasons. So we, we organize our actual applications into pods. And we also get a lot of management infrastructure to help us bring some method to this madness. We have a master server that contains stuff uh, like scheduling tools and etcd for configuration and, and secret management. And most importantly, it has a powerful APIs that you can use to programmatically orchestrate your infrastructure indirectly from tooling, from command line tools, from stuff like that. And it works in conjunction with a special container that runs on each one of those nodes that does all of the local work that it has to do. So if we step back and pull that all together, we end up with uh, a system that has uh, APIs that our machine and human users can use, uh, either using command line interfaces and UIs like we may have previously done for configuration management, but also programmatically, which gives us an opportunity for an interesting feedback loop on a lot of systems, which is, which is fun. Okay, 
So let's shift a little bit to, now we live in a world where we have those containers and we have container orchestration systems with programmatic abilities to, to change things, which is pretty cool. How does, this, how does this change kind of our security posture? Well, this, the world is a lot more dynamic than it previously was. Where previously we could kind of assume that a, a, that a process lived on a physical host for some reasonable amount of time in a world where we can quickly tear down containers and bring them up and tear them down again and bring up more of them, things move around a lot faster. And this makes things harder in some ways for kind of both the offensive side as well as the defensive side. Uh, from the offense perspective, my kill chains, I have to execute them a lot faster than I used to be able to. Because like, if, I, if I were to like get a shell on a system, like I can't assume that like that security camera or whatever, you know, is going to be there for six months later, like, like the one in my apartment probably was. Um, because these containers are scaling up and down, they're often getting torn down and destroyed and recreated very rapidly. So I have to move quickly when I find a vulnerability. And there's also more layers to break out of. Just because if I get into a pod, like I have another layer to break out to get to the physical host. So it's just another, another set of vulnerabilities I have to find to be able to take advantage of. But on the flip side, it's harder to defend in some ways as well, because a lot of the old tricks we used to use don't work as well. So for example, instrumenting the network to find like events for forensics. So like if I have a box in the network that's like passing all the packets through it, and I use that after an event to kind of reverse engineer what's happened, that information is not as useful, because I have an IP address that they were targeting on a host, but now I have to go back and figure out what containers were running on that host at that time and reconstruct it. So it's harder to do the forensics with a lot of the older tools. Any tooling I use has to be aware of uh, what containers are running on what systems. It has to be aware of whatever orchestration framework I'm using. And also, like, we just introduced a bunch of complexity. And any time you introduce more complexity, there's more opportunities for us to mess something up and for a vulnerability to be found somewhere. Because any, any sufficiently complex software is just riddled with problems. It just seems to be how it works, sadly. So the way we deal with this is the way we deal with anything that seems like a really big problem to take a bite out of. We break it down into smaller groups so we can tackle those groups one at a time. And this is kind of the way that people seem to be kind of shuffling their approach to security in a containerized world which is to focus on the kind of different phases, the different phases of the application lifecycle. So at the top, we have during development, which is tooling and features around orchestration frameworks that help us keep things safe. Actually, I have it on the next slide. It's tooling for building secure containerized services, securely building containerized services. So this is really around the features we need, like um, secret management uh, and access control to allow us to, to make those services um, designed securely from the beginning. And if we take these into account when we design our software systems, or as we adjust our software systems as we port them over, we can make those things kind of secure by design at the beginning. And some of the significant features uh, in Kubernetes that have made this a lot easier are kind of like secure inter-service communication out of the box, so you don't have to worry as much about you know, snooping between services, and uh, identity management within the cluster, as well as the role-based access control, which is finally like the only way to do uh, access control on Kubernetes as of like 1.9, which is pretty recent. But it's supplanted an older access, uh, attribute-based access control, um, much more fine-grained, much, much more effective. It also gives us an opportunity to do things like secret rotation, stuff we should have been doing anyway before, but we never had time to do. It's easier now, you should do it. But, there's a lot of content out there on this topic, so I'm not going to talk about this particular phase in much detail. Another phase that there's been a lot of interest in is during deployment uh, and during preparation to deployment. So this is all about kind of your software supply chain. So previously we'd have these like homebrew scripts or maybe like a pile of chef scripts over here and some puppet scripts over here that we'd use to do our configuration management. And these were great. They, were, they made us much more productive, but they were not very machine readable. They were not as standardized. It was harder to kind of like infer the infrastructure. But now that we have Docker files and Kubernetes descriptors, we have these relatively standardized, easily parsable kind of declarative information about what our infrastructure looks like, which opens up some really great opportunities to finding vulnerabilities before they happen. Because 
many of the vulnerabilities aren't actually going to be in your software. It's going to be in some dependency you have, um, especially if you're like running Node.js loads, which seem to pull in an enormous number of dependencies sometimes. Um, and because we have these really clear descriptors, we can, we can do static analysis on these, compare them to a repository of vulnerabilities, and it gives us a great capability to detect problems before we even deploy them. We also have the capability to add a bunch of stuff to these for further investigation. So you can add a bunch of tags, a bunch of metadata to your descriptors, and those, as you go further downstream, will, will help tremendously with forensics and other controls during runtime stuff. Oh, and also build, line, uh, build pipeline verification. Because we have these container images that uh, we, can, we can actually verify that the containers we're deploying in production are the same as the ones that came out of our continuous integration system. So, which is nice. Lots of cool stuff. And there's an enormous amount of content. This is a very exciting area, but I'm not really focusing on that either. I'm focusing on runtime security. So runtime security is dealing with problems during our actual physical like, operation time. So we're running a bunch of containers, and things will inevitably go wrong at some point. So we want to make sure that stuff is set up in a way to mitigate the damage, generally through proper configuration, which turns out to be the lowest hanging fruit, is to actually turn on security features and use them uh, even when they're not in a lot of the tutorials and stuff like that. Beyond that, we can take advantage of the security context of our operating system and the kernel and uh, the, the containers themselves, which is slightly higher hanging fruit. And then there's also this new emerging area of container aware security monitoring stuff that's pretty cool, um, especially with its ability to go back and start poking those APIs to actively mitigate, automatically mitigate a lot of problems when they happen. But that, that's a definitely a bleeding edge area that doesn't, we don't have much on yet, but I'll talk about that in, in a moment. First, let's do a demo of a sad day for someone on a very small Kubernetes cluster. Why not? So. I have a couple of Kubernetes clusters. Let me make this a little, it's pretty readable, I hope. Let me make that a little bigger, drag it over here, and bring up my notes so I have the very long commands so I don't have to, you don't have to sit as I type them. Oh, they got squashed. Good thing I have a backup. Some of these commands are long and I don't want to make you sit through while I type them. So. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to a default configured cluster. So this is uh, Kubernetes 1.8, more recent version, and this is just a default configuration. And what I did is I kind of deployed a simple web application, assuming I just went through like the Kubernetes 101 quick start and I just deployed it how, how it would be by default. So I'm gonna connect to that cluster, get, get the credentials so I can connect to it. And we'll see that it's, it's a very, very, very small cluster. Uh, get pods. We have a whopping couple of pods running. We'll see if this, hey, it actually responded. OK. So we have a couple of pods running. We have an Nginx server that's just boring Nginx server. Uh, we also have this node application uh, that, that was deployed. Uh, hello vulnerability. I wonder what's up with that. Um, so, hello vulnerability is an unwise application. Uh, somebody was very lazy with their API design, and let's, let's take a look at it. Let's see what they did. So, if we, um, let's go find, uh, let's see, get services, and it is, oh no, it's a deployment. So, if we describe the deployment, Actually, what do we want to do? We want to, we want to expose it as a service first, because right now it's locked down. Except I'll actually type it right. And we will get the services again, and now we'll wait while it comes on up, and then we can take a look at it from the internet and see what terrible mistakes have been made. Let's take a moment while we wait for that external IP to come up. Still pending. The fun part, it's not always instantaneous. Oh, 
We'll give it a moment and then we'll go to my video recording when the network gods were happier. Hey, you got it, okay. So, yes, I, I exposed the service. And I can just go to this IP address and it's like, hey, that's a, that's a funny looking web page. I wonder what's up with that. Um, this is the kind of system, you actually stumble on these kinds of things surprisingly often, uh, even just when surfing around. And when someone were to stumble upon this thing, even if it's like not easily enumeratable, even if it's not got a DNS address, they're going to they're gonna start poking it, or it might be an automated system that gives it a poke. So it's just a matter of time before somebody figures out like that, that oh, you can just type a command into a git parameter. That's, that's a little suspicious. And then you can, from this, basically at this point, it's already pretty much game over because once you have some kind of command injection, you can install a reverse shell and then everything falls apart. So I can do things like um, apt-get dash y um, install screen. I like screen. Just to kind of verify that it can actually install dependencies. And uh, sure enough, like, Hey, it worked. That, that's kind of disturbing. So at that point, that's, that's when you've discovered something. And like these, these kinds of things are all over the world. So let me clear the service for now so that it doesn't get pwned while I'm doing the rest of the demo. So we can assume that I got a shell. So let's just, let's just use a regular shell to see what I can do once I've accomplished that. Well, first, I want to get the pod. So get the pods, there's the actual pod name. Just run, run bash on it, or just shell, I guess. No, I'll actually, I'll actually do that with bash. There, now we have a fancy shell. So once I'm here, it's actually amazing what, what you can do once you've compromised a pod. So the first thing I would do when I got here is I'd probably like look around, see what I can do, see if I can install stuff. Like I'd probably um, update and um, probably install some tools for me to poke around a little more, like maybe Nmap to kind of explore the network. Maybe curl, another wonderful tool for causing all sorts of havoc. but we don't have to sit through that. Um, but another thing you can do is, after you've, you've started, finished enumerating all the different network resources you can get to directly in the pod, is once you're in a pod, you can generally just install a kube control once you've discovered that you're in a Kubernetes cluster. And then you can use that to look around and see the other pods and access their metadata. So. So I see that there's an Nginx one running. So let's take a look at that. So we describe the Nginx, except actually give it the right context. Oh, and there, there's like, it's running. Um, I bet there's an IP address I can hit. Hey, there is. And you, if, if by default, the network is just open within the rest of that cluster. So I can just curl that IP address and I can access that, which in the, for Nginx is not a big deal, but this, if this was like a Redis server running or a database um, that didn't have very good security credentials, like I could cause all sorts of havoc with that. Furthermore, if I've discovered, once I discover kind of which cloud system I'm running on, I can go get the tooling for that as well. So I can, for example, download, um, now that I've figured out that I'm running Google Cloud Platform, which I can figure out just from the IP address, the external IP address, then I can start running uh, the Google Cloud stuff, because by default, the default service account has quite a few permissions, as it turns out. Um, so if I just run the G Cloud tool, there's uh, one of the, my favorite permissions that it gets by default is the, the full compute API, which is, you can do a lot with. So you can do compute instances list, and now I can see not only the different pods that are near me in, uh, in my node, but I can also see all of the different VMs running on that Google Cloud Platform account. So this is a good reason to actually like, start to lock down those permissions. Because uh, in addition to seeing them, I also have write access to that API. 
So I can, uh, I, could, I could print my access token, um, which I, I'll just pipe to Word. So it actually did send something. I can print an access token that I can use from a different system, like somewhere I have more tools to do things on that one. I can also um, create more VMs. So I can go to gcloud, I can do compute instances, create, yay demo. And yes, I want to create it in that zone. And if I go back to my main console, I can see that, yes, a new, a new VM appeared. There it is, yay demo. So I can create new nodes. I can also use this to like insert SSH, because I can cause all sorts of havoc with it. So default configurations, which are enough to kind of get you through quick starts, are rarely enough to go to production. And uh, it's, it's important to secure early before you end up in a situation where making some of these changes will break things. OK, so there's a demo. Bad things happened. Let's keep on moving. I'm a little behind time, so let me speed up. So first, let's just talk about some of the low-hanging fruit you can do to control the situation. Because security always kind of ends up as a little bit of an afterthought. We never have enough time to really really focus on it. But as it turns out, there's a whole lot of things you can do just on top of the demo situation, uh, the default situation, that will, will prevent all of this kind of craziness from happening, which is great. A very little bit goes a whole long way. So before that, though, some just general advice. So while I was poking around on tutorials, I see this pattern all the time for Kubernetes stuff. Never do this. Um, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but if there's a random URL and it's ku control create dash f, there can be anything in that YAML file. Um, and it might actually respond different when you put it in the browser than if you run it with kube control. You should download that and, and run it from locally. So if you only remember one thing from this talk as you poke around in Kubernetes, when you see a tutorial that says to do this, don't do that. Um, because it's worse than just piping to bash because it can create a thousand of those things before you even notice. Oh, another thing, uh, just kind of another sidebar, is there's a Kubernetes dashboard, which is really cool. Don't run it in production. Um, like, it's great to run when you tinker around. If you are sure you need it, bring it up when you need it, and then turn it, turn it down when you don't need it. Uh, it's one of the benefits of, of Kubernetes. It's easy to create those containers easily. It, um, it runs with a very privileged Kubernetes service account, and its security is not that great by default. Uh, so the easiest thing to do is just not to run it and do your tooling somewhere else. But let's talk about that actual low-hanging fruit on configuration stuff. So the first one is I was running it in GKE, and I think the scariest thing I saw was that the default service account, the default GCP service account, um, was able to create VMs and stuff like that. And that's great for kind of getting moving as a developer when you're first in something. But in general, when you're doing anything on a cloud provider, Start with the minimum number of permissions you need, and then incrementally add them as you need them. And as it turns out, the, the, near, the minimum permissions we need to run a GKE node is only a few narrow permissions. And we can go ahead and create a user that does that um, programmatically. Uh, I went ahead and created one ahead of time, um, but I'll skip that part of the, the demo for now. But yeah, so it's just a few commands that you can type in to create this user. There's even like a, a script in the documentation you can run. Or you can just create it via the UI. And then when you create your cluster, use, the, use that minimum permission one, and it will not be able to, to break out of that uh, container to the project. Another thing is the next very first thing is kind of Kubernetes configuration is network policies. Network policies are awesome. They are a way to prevent that hacker from jumping between pods that they don't need to. Because there's no reason that my hello vulnerability API needed to be able to talk to that web server across my deployment. It just, there's no reason it needed to be over there. And the documentation for this can get kind of dense kind of fast, especially if you're new to Kubernetes. But one of my peers at Google has done some amazing work and has this beautiful GitHub repo full of like 14 of the most wonderful examples I've seen of network policies for Kubernetes. They have little pictures showing like a situation with like a namespace and what the ingress can do and what ingress does not work. And um, instructions for creating a cluster, or creating you know, an environment that you can run it in, and then a very simple description of a network policy that can apply to that. And uh, great advice that um, denying all traffic is, is a great way to start. So there's a very simple network policy that I'd recommend you start with, which is just denying ingress to all of your different network uh, namespaces. You can also, like this one is set up by tag, so it'll do it to all, all the web servers. So I can go ahead and run that on my system to remediate it right now. 
So let's go um, and exit out of this. And if I want to remediate that, I'm going to switch over to a cluster that already has a service account set up um, differently because that, that took a few minutes to roll. So I'm not going to make you sit through that. But let's go down to back to Kubernetes engine and look at not my default cluster, my happy cluster. And the only difference here is it has a different GCP service account set up for it. Let's get those credentials. Go back to Cloud Shell, and now we're going to talk to this very similar Kubernetes cluster. And um, let's get the network policies, which by default, there's nothing there. So it's going to tell us there's no network policies. I guess it takes a minute for this credentials to start working. No network found, policies found. But what I did ahead of time is I downloaded the deny all one, which we're just going to apply to a web server to get started. So we're going to deny all to all of the things that are tagged as a web server. Remember that metadata I said you should add to things? This is where it starts to pay off. And now if we log into our system, um, which we'll do in just a moment, we can verify that we cannot hop between nodes. So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's go ahead and see if just those, those two little changes we made have any impact on our situation. And so let's take a look at the pods we have in this cluster. I have, uh, oh, BusyBox, a different one, but that's okay. So let's um, run a shell on BusyBox and see Uh, what we can do with that. So, exec dash. This busy box is just sh. Yay, okay, so we have a shell here. And now what we'll find is, let me make another tab and get the credentials for happy cluster again so that we can see, because I forgot to get the IP address of. the internal IP address of that other pod. Uh, crap for the IP address of our Nginx pod. So now that we've, got, we've managed to, to get our, oh, not a resource. I do this all the time. There we go. Let's describe the pod Nginx and get its internal IP address. So if we do that, boop, and go over here. We don't have curl, but we have wget. If we try and wget it, we can no longer connect to it, which is great. That means that we can't jump into that web server anymore because it's denying that ingress traffic from our other nodes, which is great. We probably want to punch a little more holes into that so we can get to it from our load balancer. Right now, it's deny all has basically brought it down entirely, but it's close enough. We can also uh, verify that having the, um, the, the, the more restricted GCP service account prevents problems, although I can't do that from BusyBox, so I'll have to do it from here. So. Um, Let's log into that one. Let's do a shell there into the Nginx node. And let's verify that we can't escape out of that and take a look at the rest of our stuff. So tab complete was not fast enough. There we go. So even if we just try and do an instances list, oh, compute instances list. Yeah, gcloud and kube control use like backwards notation for, for groupings. So going back and forth, same with Docker. I always kind of get the order of them mixed up. But yeah, we can see that this will basically hang. Eventually it'll come back and say that it was unable to connect. So we've been successful at denying a few different of those problems. 
So now, like, if someone inevitably ends up dropping that shell, the problem is not too serious. So things are a lot better now. Yay! And there was only like two little tiny configuration changes. And this also kind of reveals a good approach to doing it. Like spend a little bit of time figuring out what happens. Like do a shell into your stuff and see what kind of stuff you can do. That's how I figured out like the lowest hanging fruit is I just dropped a shell in a system and saw what I could do with it. Um, and it turns out it was not that hard to fix these problems. But if you end up in a situation where you have more than a couple hours to apply security stuff to your project, there's some just higher up fruit, just a couple branches up. But they get a lot more complicated, um, but they are a lot more capable in terms of restricting certain stuff. So the next thing I would do is I would take advantage of the security context of the rest of the operating system and further restrict permissions with things like AppArmor, SE Linux, and SecComp. And some of the kinds of things you can do with this are, whoop, for example, um, App Armor, one of my favorite places to start with is um, you can, like, for example, create an App Armor profile that's pretty easy. Uh, it's a little more involved than the stuff we already did, but you can deny, you can basically make all the file systems read only, which I've actually deployed loads in production in the past that didn't really need to write to the file system. There weren't many of them. But even the ones that did a lot of file system activity had pretty narrow channels that they did those file system writes. And using these features, you can just restrict their ability to write to the file system. And one of the cool parts about that is it limits the, uh, an intruder's ability to install a bunch of their tools and just really slows them down. So hopefully you'll look at copy the next time you cycle your containers anyway. So there's a link to that. Um, and then kind of the next piece, if you have even more time, you might want to venture into the land of kind of container and Kubernetes aware security monitoring. And this works a lot like a lot of other monitoring stuff we've done in the past, except it's much, 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 much more detailed than like the stuff I would use for performance monitoring and kind of uptime monitoring. And um, unfortunately, this is a place where most of the products are commercial, like the, the solutions are all commercial products right now. The open source stuff has not really caught up to it yet. but there is, you know, there's, there's starting to be some momentum over the last few months, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, and the cool thing about these systems is a lot of them can do automated remediation. They, they can take advantage of those APIs on your kube control, uh, on, your, on your Kubernetes uh, uh, service, and um, they can actually do things like automatically block off containers or bring them down or, you know, things like that, restrict resources to try and limit the damage. And these all kind of simple, follow a pretty similar deployment model, which I'll jump through very quickly. Uh, they have some kind of management container that runs in your pod that kind of orchestrates everything. Then they either have a privileged container or a kernel extension that runs on the node itself that collects information. They're generally collecting things like network events, um, either via just like, you know, putting themselves in the middle through, through network address translation or via e, uh, eBPF, um, Berkeley packet filters, which are more precise in their capability of getting that network information, or they just look at all the system calls that flow through, which is an enormous amount of data, but it is a gold mine for doing forensics later. And then they either shuffle them off to a local disk, they push them up in a hosted database, which is popular for the commercial products, or some of them have the ability to like turn up to 11 when you've noticed an event, save a lot more data in something fast, like a, like a ring buffer running on the node. And there are a few different options out there right now. Um, Sysdig, which is a commercial product, primarily has a bunch of open source stuff that you can actually get pretty far with right away. There's the Sysdig tool, which actually does the system call filtering itself, um, which you can just, it's just a command line tool you can run, which is really useful for doing tracing anyway. Uh, but they also have a couple more open source projects they've started to put time into recently. An inspector program, which can help you dig through those incredibly verbose system call files. And uh, Falco, which is a system for running rules against that stream of system call events. It, it's pretty far. Um, I think the only example integration is a Slack integration, though. So it's definitely not like a cohesive solution. Uh, it's more of kind of a, a gateway drug to, to their commercial product. But if you have existing monitoring systems, you can probably integrate it into it pretty well, you know, like you know, some kind of event search or something like that. Celium uh, is doing the Berkeley packet filter stuff, and that's an open source project. Um, it's uh, it, it does not uh, always work on a lot of the managed Kubernetes instances, um, but we're, we're getting there. Um, and it's, it seems like it's very promising. I haven't had a chance to dig into it too much. Encapsulate is another commercial product that's starting to push some stuff into the open source. Uh, it's definitely worth checking out. I haven't had time to dig into that stuff either yet, though. But I definitely check out the Sysdig stuff first. 
So yeah, I guess we have a couple minutes left, just wrapping up. So this is the stuff we discussed, kind of an overview of security concepts and kind of the, the hacker mentality and security mentality for offensive and defensive security. We talked a little bit about containers and Kubernetes and how that impacts our perspective on security as someone defending against attacks and bad stuff. Then I showed you a couple of pieces of low-hanging fruit and a couple of things to avoid doing. Uh, you know, when you don't actually have time to do security, but you want to implement something. And then we talked a little bit about a few other things we can do above that. So with that, thank you very much for, for hanging out and listening to me talk. Uh, I'll be around for questions after the talk, because I don't, don't think I have much time right now. Uh, the slides are up there at this link. So definitely go. Spend a little more time on security stuff, and maybe contribute to some of those awesome open source projects that are happening now. So thanks so much.